Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our, our panel discussion today called Silenced No More, Speak Up for the Women of Afghanistan. We've gathered here today to amplify the voices of the women in Afghanistan who are being suppressed and whose freedom and rights have been taken away by the Taliban regime. With the FAR, we intend to spread these voices all over the world. We're committed to our ideals of freedoms, equality, and democracy. Now, to start the program and to start our discourse, I kindly invite our most respected guests to come on the stage. Please welcome Ms. Mariam Munsef, founder and CEO of Onward, entrepreneur and former member of Canadian Parliament and Cabinet Minister. Mariam John Munsef. And please welcome Ms. Murray Clark, Global Development and Human Rights Expert and Chief Programs Officer of Women for Women International. And please welcome Ambassador Roya Rahmani, Chair of Delphos International and former Ambassador of Afghanistan to the United States and Indonesia. Welcome. Dear audience and respected panelists, briefly I'll explain that our discussion tonight is based on three main points. In the first segment, we have a brief assessment of the situation of women in Afghanistan. The second segment will be related to the consequences of the continuation of the current disappointing uh, situation. And in the third segment, we will explore possible solutions and suggestions to uh, change the current situation. And at the end of uh, the panel, we will give our audience the opportunity to present their questions to our panelists. Before we proceed any further, let's start from the heart of tragedy, from Afghanistan and a girl in Afghanistan. Although it is currently around 4 a.m. in Kabul, but one of the brave and courageous women from inside Afghanistan is live with us in this panel discussion. For security reasons, we cannot reveal her identity, but we will call her Farhunda for tonight. And we thank her for joining our discussion despite the risks. So, Farhunda and John, um, first of all, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, as you're currently joining us from the depths of the tragedy in Afghanistan, please share your current situation and convey your feelings as well as those of other women. As uh, you all see my appearance, let's also talk about our situation in Afghanistan. I'm one of a uh, woman who uh, is suffering difficulty and many troubles during this uh, next to three years in Afghanistan. Um, the current government put a wall which is built by their own idea and opinion between women and life, between women and freedom, between women and independence, between women and their own choice. They want us to live the way they want. They want to create new law and new rule for us. And uh, being a woman in Afghanistan is not easy for now. We are not allowed to study. We are not allowed to work. We are not allowed to travel. We are not allowed to work. We are not allowed to go anywhere without a man. We are not allowed to go to gym. We are not allowed to go to park. We are not allowed um, to go even for a beauty salon because the government put some rule for us, which is not acceptable for a human. Not only in Afghanistan, no one can accept this situation, but here we are suffering day by day. They behave as disrespectful anytime. If I share my stories in, during this year with them, it's really 
her table. I feel very uh, sad when I remember what they did with us. Uh, I do remember uh, when they came uh, to Afghanistan in 2021, and after a few months, they start a search operation in houses. They come to my house and in my room. They search everything, even my private things. You know what I'm saying, even my private things. And they see my paintings. I uh, learned years to become a professional art artist. And they tore up all of my work and pushed them in the floor and said, it's haram. Words cannot express how I felt that day. And I will never forget that. How do they push my ears, experience and achievement just in a few moments. And how disrespectful was their behavior with me. And uh, I was uh, a teacher in an art education center. One of my students saw me in a street a few months ago. And uh, he just asked me, how are you, ma'am? How is everything going? But the government investigator, we call, uh, they called him uh, Amr Bel Maru. They uh, arrested that boy while you're talking with her and sent him to the jail for one day while he was just 15 or uh, 16 years old. He was underage. But he spent one day in the jail just because he talked with a woman on the street. We are not even comfortable to walk on the street or talk with anyone. And we have to, currently I have to hide my identity, who I am, what I'm doing, just because I want to be safe and secure. Uh, Afghanistan overall is not secure for women. And uh, every woman in Afghanistan is suffering many troubles. I was a teacher in university. My student graduated this year, but only boys, not girls. They are still at the same stage. Why? Just because we are women or just because we are a girl? And the biggest, our fault or the biggest sin in Afghanistan is to be a woman. We are trying our best to suffer these uh, conditions, but sometimes we lose the hope. We lose what we achieved during 20 years. In just two years, they take away all of rights of us and all of our freedom. Farhunda John, uh, thank you so much for being with us. It's heartbreaking to, to hear your story, and thank you for sharing your story. This empty chair here is actually uh, set up here for Farhunda John and all the other women in Afghanistan who don't have a voice of their own. We wanted to give uh, them this platform, and she's talking, obviously, on behalf of all the other Afghan women in Afghanistan. Um, so stay here with us. Ambassador uh, Rahmani, having served as the ambassador of Afghanistan uh, to the United States and being actively involved in women's rights in this country, is the current status of Afghan women a central topic of discussion and a concern for the United States? Uh, and how would you assess the situation of Afghan women? Thank you very much. A warm good evening and salams to everyone present here and uh, to all the distinguished panelists. Um, first of all, <clears throat> to the first part of your question, whether women's rights is a central issue in American policy, I must say that Afghanistan is not central to the American policy at all at this point. Uh, so the whole idea of what is happening there is now being overlooked because of the preoccupation that the international community has with multiple other issues. So Afghanistan as a whole is being overlooked. It's forgotten land. Unfortunately, this has been the fate of the country for the good, at least, if not the whole of the past century, but a very good part of it, that Afghanistan has been yo-yoing between being a forgotten land, 
on a competition field for the uh, external powers. At this point, uh, as, as I mentioned, it is not central to any policies here or anywhere internationally. But when even it was a central issue within the international community's policies, it was a security issue. Afghanistan was only and always looked primarily as a security problem, as a security issue. Women's rights was the one that was bringing moral legitimacy to that cause. It was the icing. It was something that nobody could say no to. <clears throat> now, for whatever is left, there is still, of course, interest in women's rights simply from a human rights or a human standpoint. Nothing more than that. And as a result, what we see is very piecemeal efforts here and there, and nothing of a scale and significance as a result of that. To your question of how I am assessing the situation of women in Afghanistan, I would say in her presence, in Farhonda's presence, I would not have the authority to speak to that. She is the best person to describe and bring that news of what is going on, and you heard it firsthand from her. What I could barely say and mainly say is we are talking now about Afghanistan as a country that has sent half of its population to prison. Simple. Half of the population has to be in the prison. And with that, what does that mean? It means the future of the country is being taken in hostage. The progress is being rendered, and it is devastating for, for Afghanistan, for its future. It's a generational loss. But more importantly, it's also going to be a problem, a dangerous one, for, re for region and globally. So the situation overall is obviously a huge problem. But I would like to circle back to what I was saying before. Afghanistan, when it was central, it was a security issue. Now, uh, I know that we will be discussing what we can do. But let me plant this at this point and say, so long as women's rights is treated as a checkbox, as a nicety, as a separate issue from the rest of the matters, it is not going to sustainable, it's not going to be successful. Women's rights is a security issue, women's rights is an economic issue, women's rights is a social issue, and it cannot be separate. And the whole problem, despite the massive achievements that we had over the past decades, was that it was not well integrated into the lens that the world was looking into Afghanistan. Women's rights was completely separate from the security, economics, social, and overall development issue. So with that, I think maybe we could, we could segue uh, further in the next segment. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your input and information. Ms. Munsif, um, with your background in advocating for women's rights, how do you uh, perceive the current situation of women in Afghanistan? Also, do you have any information about the contribution um, of Afghan diaspora in Canada toward supporting women in Afghanistan? Thank you for that question, Ariana John. Uh, hello, everybody. Salam Mahsus, the Dustana Afghan, the Zananish Shojoy Afghan, Mr. Fahuna John, the Bawjuri, the John in Abhatare. They seize opportunities like this to raise the voice of Afghan women. Um, first of all, the status of women in Afghanistan is unclear. And that in itself is a problem. Let me give you an example. What do we know about the experience of the Pashtun woman living in rural Afghanistan? How is her experience different than the Hazara woman who not too long ago lost her loved ones in a school bombing? How is that experience different than the widow in Kabul begging for food, begging for money to keep her kids well? And how is that experience 
different than the Afghan woman in Tajikistan, in Pakistan, in India, in Iran, waiting, bala taklif, waiting to figure out what's going to happen to her. And then what about the woman who has found asylum in a safe third country, who is feeling guilty, who's experiencing language barriers, housing barriers, job barriers, and feeling guilty because she survived and she is safe and her loved ones aren't. The first problem we have is that we are not clear on the facts on the ground and Afghanistan remains one of the most dangerous places for journalists. The voice of women like Farhunda John becomes even more important. What we do know, and Nahid Farid, former MP for Herat, uh, wrote a really powerful article about this. What we do know is that right now, about 4% of Afghan women say that they can afford food. What we do know is that about 57% are saying that girls younger than 19 have to be and are being married off. What we do know is that women are selling their organs because they don't have money to feed their families. Families are selling their daughters, little girls, for money because they have no other choice. And what we do know is that too many are taking their lives because the idea of li living again under an oppressive Taliban regime after two decades of tasting freedom and liberty and opportunity is just unbearable. Now, those of us who are fortunate enough to live in places like Canada, like the US, who have freedom to move, who have freedom to go to the gym, who can go to the park, who can vote, who can put our names on a ballot, who can be journalists with freedom, who can start our own organizations, it's hard for us to really comprehend what's happening. And this is the real tragedy. The status of women in Afghanistan right now is probably catastrophic. But what we know is only the tip of the iceberg. This is why initiatives like DEFA are important. And I'm grateful for you, you. Ariana John. You're thank one of the you. few humans on the planet who could create a platform like this. Oh, thank you. So good for you for doing this. And I hope that your work continues to grow. This is why we need an international inquiry on the status of Afghan women. This is why we need to hold accountable the oppressive regime who has come back for a second time. The women have been handed back to them with impunity, they are, they are taking rights away. So the status of women in Afghanistan is dire, that we don't talk about them is scary, and that they have been silenced and erased is just another reminder that the Taliban's war on women is strong, it's happening, and unless we raise the voice of Afghan women and girls like we are here today, the Taliban will win and the situation will get worse. Thank you, Mariam John. Uh, may I say that it's such an honor for me to have the three of you uh, with me on the stage tonight. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, my next question is to uh, Ms. Clark. Has Women for Women International conducted any formal study on the situation of the women in Afghanistan? And how does your organization address the current situation of women in Afghanistan? Thank you for that question, and, and thank you so much for this platform. I couldn't agree more with my panelists that what you are offering is an opportunity for us to turn around an unimaginable situation and build the type of collective power that women have to revolutionize their worlds, their homes, their families, their communities, and their countries. And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to be here with you for that. So, and I appreciate that here tonight, we also have an opportunity to hear really directly the voices of Afghan women that is so central. It absolutely must be the center driving force that propels us towards solutions. And the quote that breaks my heart when I look through our, our research says, day by day, 
the Taliban are passing new rules which shorten the circle of our life. And I think of that when I think of being able to go to a park or not. Um, I think of that when I think about the closing of beauty parlors and beauty salons. Because what is a beauty parlor or a beauty salon for a woman? It's a place where we feel beautiful, that we come together in community with one another. We take time for ourselves in a beauty salon. But the thing is, that makes it such a dangerous place if you don't want women to have rights and power in society. Because when women come together in groups and they share their experiences and they share their stories, they organize. And that is happening even still today. And so I still have hope, even despite all of the tremendous challenges that you are hearing about tonight. I do have hope. I even see it already in the women in our program, that they are daring to take chances with one another and to push back and change their circumstance. Thank you, Ms. Clark, and thank, thank you, everyone, for your insights. Um, now let's proceed with the second segment of the panel, uh, which is the consequences of the continuation of the current situation. Right now, as we speak, more than one million girls are banned by the Taliban from going to school, which is the most basic rights of a human. At the same time, more than 100,000 of women have been prevented from attending university. Tens of thousands of women are still out of work. Where will this situation lead to, and what are the consequences of continuation of the current situation? My question is to you, uh, Ms. Munsef. Given the severe challenges, um, the violence, gender, apartheid, limited education, access, uh, underage marriages, and social exclusion faced by Afghan women. What profound implications do these issues hold for their well-being and future prospects? I'm really glad you used the term gender apartheid, Ariana John. Uh, this is a term that uh, human rights defenders, particularly Afghan women, have been very clear and vocal about in international fora. To solve a problem, we must name it first. And I'm really proud of the women who are making the case that what is happening is a gender apartheid. What else can you call it when the only country in the world to say no more education for you little girls after grade six is Afghanistan? What else do you call it? So what is the consequence? Yes, we will run out of female doctors when we tell them they can't go to school, when we tell them they can't go outside without the permission of the male head uh, of the family, when we tell them that if they go and work on their confidence or self-esteem, be it at the gym or at the park or at the beauty parlor, that they are breaking the law. The consequence is Afghanistan, our ancestral land, loses the potential of more than half its population. What is happening now, though, and those of us who live outside Afghanistan have seen over the past two years the immediate consequences of an oppressive regime in charge. The consequence is that humanitarian aid is even more difficult to flow into Afghanistan at a time when it's needed most. Winter is here. And the supplies, whether it's medicine or food related or clothing or otherwise, doesn't get to where it needs to get to. The consequence for those on the ground is, as Madam Ambassador said, generation, generational cost, a generational loss. Do we think that the little boys and the young men who their teachers they see in the streets and can't talk to them anymore? Do we think that this doesn't affect their well-being and their mental health? Do we think that those little girls who grew up watching their mothers become members of parliament, lawyers, judges, do we think that there's no consequence for them when they realize there is no future for them? But there's a bigger consequence here, and Madam Ambassador, you referred to this. 
The thing with the status of women in Afghanistan right now is this. If a group of terrorists can walk into a capital city and overthrow a democratically elected government and overnight undo decades of hard-won gains in one corner of the world, they can do that anywhere. The message being sent to those who hate women, to misogynists, is that you can get away with this kind of oppression. These criminal acts with impunity aren't just hurting Afghan women and the people of Afghanistan and the future of Afghanistan, but they send a dangerous message to anyone whose ideology is about undoing the hard-won gains of women. And so we see Roe v. Wade being overturned. And so we see the rates of gender-based violence increase online, in workplaces, behind closed doors in people's homes. And so we see the violence that leaders and political actors experience go up, emboldened by the bad guys in that corner of the world got away with it. So the imperative isn't just greater instability in Afghanistan, because now it's a terrorist safe ground. The imperative isn't just the women of Afghanistan need their voices raised and their rights back. The imperative is if they can do it to those women, they can do it to any women. And so the women of Afghanistan, when the women of Afghanistan speak up, when the women of Iran speak up, they are fighting for all of us. And it is our responsibility to protect all our hard-won gains for future generations to stand with them. That's right. My name is John. Um, considering the, the, the gra gravity of these uh, challenges, could you elaborate on the key role that men can play in addressing and solving the horrors faced by Afghan women? I'd be happy to. I'm the mother of a little boy now, and I see it as a big part of my responsibility to raise a decent and kind man. And I need all the help I can get. If I've been able to achieve anything in my life, it's been because my mother was raised by a man who looked at his little girl who was born after four boys and said, you're gonna be the first woman doctor in our family. Oh. My grandfather stood with my mother and supported her. And that in, it, in itself was a big deal. But my mother then raised us girls with that same belief. I've had uncles who have given us after my father was killed, who gave us everything, even when they had nothing. They opened doors for us. As a refugee in Canada, and then when I could stand on my own feet, there have been so many good men who have stood with me, have opened doors for me, have shown me how to navigate the world for leaders, especially a male-dominated world. Now, imagine the life of the woman in Afghanistan. Imagine a future where half of Afghanistan's population stands up and says, you can't treat our sisters, our daughters, our wives, our mothers like this. Imagine a world where Afghan men unequivocally, 100%, stand with their women. That's a future worth fighting for. That's a future, the only way that will get a bright future for the women of Afghanistan. But right now, without the voice of Afghan men, and I'm saying there are a lot of good men with us, but without a strong, clear, unequivocal plea, demand from Afghan men that what is happening to Afghan women is not okay, how can we expect anyone else to stand up for the women of Afghanistan. So this is my call to Afghan men. 
in Afghanistan and all over the world. When you see one of us succeed, stand with us, support us, celebrate us. Don't be perfectionist, none of us are perfect. <laughs> On social media, when you see us being hunted, being violated, stand up for us. Your voice carries far. When this panel is aired, and more time is spent on our makeup, on our clothing, on the way we did our hair, say cut it out. Say it's not okay. And instead, direct attention to the substance of the matter. Men, you hold a lot of power. And we need you with us for this fight because the future of Afghanistan and the future of your daughters and yourselves depends on the well-being of us women doing well. Absolutely, thank you so much. That was some beautiful words you just said, uh, Mariam John, and I really hope that Afghan men will listen to those words. I um, will. And practice on it as well. <laughs> there are some good ones out there, I have to be honest. It's not that all Afghan men uh, are like that, but I hope the rest of them can learn from the better ones. Maybe they don't know how. Ariana John. Probably. Maybe they don't know how, and maybe those who do know how yes. can show the way. That's right. Ms. Clark, uh, you have worked in relief and food security program in several countries around the world. Currently, millions of women and children in Afghanistan are facing food shortages and serious health problems. According to your experience, where will the continuation of this situation lead Afghan women? And what will be the impact of such a disaster? I mean, I feel like it's been said now a couple times. We see generation at risk. And we can't say it more strongly, right? The generation that gets lost if you imprison half of your, your society, the generation that gets lost when they don't have access to school and don't have access to all of the other things that build your whole person, including parks and beauty salons, right? So we're seeing that with food insecurity as well because the level of hunger that is happening right now in Afghanistan and the impact that has on that future generation and on all of the people in Afghanistan right now is incredibly devastating because if you withhold food, especially for children, especially for children who are under two or under five, it, it completely shifts their potential outlook for their life. Stunting, so the inability to grow to your full height, uh, brain loss, like the loss of the amount of attention, um, the ability to think clearly, brain fog, all of those are consequences of malnutrition, starvation, and deep hunger. The ability to learn, the ability to learn new things, the ability to adapt, actually are all connected to being able to have enough nutrition in your body to fuel you. And things like rules that don't allow women international aid workers to be a part of distribution of food aid means that it's not only that everyone is hungry, and hangry, here in the US they have that, that, that description, hangry, right? The displaced aggression of when you're hungry and it makes you angry. But if women are not distributing food and women are not allowed to be out getting access to that food, who is disproportionately hurt by those two policies, by those realities? And this food crisis, we saw it coming. We saw it coming in the entire year before the change of government. Because if it's too dangerous to farm and it's too dangerous to harvest, you will have a food crisis. And the world saw it coming and didn't take the necessary action to ensure safeguarding access to food and water and basic needs for women and their families and men. So I think it's, um, I think it's, again, another underscore of how it's undermining the future generations 
We're losing a generation to hunger, and it doesn't have to be that way. But part of the solution is not only food aid. So yes, we need food and nutrition aid at massive scale. But we also need women to be able to have food sovereignty, not just food security. That means the ownership over the production and creation of food for their families. So that's why we're big advocates for things like poultry kits and kitchen garden kits and other things that we can they can become small businesses. Then you're selling the eggs, you're selling the meat, you're being able to provide for your family. You're controlling the production. And women need more than ever in Afghanistan to be able to have control over the production of food and to be able to feed their families. Thank you, uh, Ms. Clark. On behalf of all the Afghans, I would like to thank you for everything you're doing for Afghanistan and the Afghan women. Um, Ambassador Rahmani, you have faced various challenges in life as a woman from Afghanistan, including immigration and the initial emergence of the Taliban group. Drawing from these experiences, how do you assess the potential consequences of persisting in the current situation? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, how do I assess the persistence? The I think the damage is already done. We have already lost so much. Every month of the persistence of this situation is rolling back at least a year of the very hard one advancements that we had. Uh, from the crisis in mental health among women to the rates of suicide, to the increased violence against women within the household, to the fact that recently uh, UN Women did a study and found out that women's role in decision making has decreased over 100% already within the household because of the situation. And Minister Munsef very well described that, that the, the dynamics between men and women, boys and girls within a household. When this brother sees her sister becoming, being reduced to an object, to a servant, to a commodity and in the household, his entire psyche changes too. And what is it going to do to him? As he loses respect to his sister, as he loses respect to his mother, what is it doing to his own dignity? What is it doing to his own upbringing? He would become a violent man. He would become a man that is no good for the society, who doesn't care and understands common good. So this is, of course, the perpetuation of this situation is quite dire is uh, something that every day, and I, I, I can't speak better than Farhonda can about this, that what does it do to the women, to the men, to the boys, to the girls, to everyone back in Afghanistan. Afghan women are more than resilient, more than hardworking. They have done it before and they will go, come out of this as well, stronger. But the point is, how can we preserve as much as we can? How can we prevent the losses to the extent that we can? So when I speak to them, I think they can do it. They need to still continue, despite all the challenges, to be hopeful. Because in my life, I have seen five regime changes. So I don't think Afghanistan is done with this uh, situation. It will change. The change is there. It's in the horizon. It is you that you do not lose hope. You do not subscribe to the faith that a few people have come and prescribed for you for their own power. Nothing else but power. So my plea to them is they are our role models. They are our people who are standing. The fact that you are doing this, the fact that, that you have shown so many young girls that they can pursue their interests, their love, despite the challenges, is a testament to that. It's not easy, but it's possible. So keep on pressing. You can do it, is my sentiment to them. I love that. You mentioned such an important word, hope. 
that is something very important, and I think it's important for people not to lose hope, because without hope, there is nothing. From this moment forward, I'm going to call you uh, Rukhshana, and I would like to thank you for your patience. I know it's uh, uh, late, uh, very early in the morning out there, and you have been so sweet and patient with us. My question to you, Rukhshana John, is how do you feel uh, when you think that you would remain a victim of this situation for many years, and you would not be able to exercise your basic rights in that society as other women in other countries? Uh, when you live in a country that some people came by weapon, guns, and force, and captured and surrounded people uh, for, uh, to achieve their own uh, specific uh, goals, and uh, used uh, the peoples uh, uh, for their own be in their own idea. Uh, so uh, how we can Im uh, imagine our future uh, to live in this situation anymore? They capture all people, especially women, and they want to use us to receive uh, their own or achieve their own goals. Uh, how we can imagine what will uh, do in the future or what will have, uh, uh, which kind of future we will have? Um, if uh, there is a future, it is not uh, possible under this condition and situation we have. We just see a darkness here. And uh, yes, I know that it may be changeable, but when, when I'm just 26 years old, and when I every time pass it, my change will become over and over. So. When I become an old woman, then I can achieve my all uh, rights. It's really hard. I understand. I spend my best days, but uh, in darkness, and I didn't see any uh, hope. And even people are lost their hope. Everyone wants to leave the country. Everyone wants to go. Violence has increased day by day in every se such a sector for everyone. So. To me, in this situation, it's not easy, but we are suffering and we, are, we all are doing our best to just be alive and hopeful. Thank you so much, Rukhshana John. My heart really goes out to you and all, all the other Afghan women uh, who are suffering in, inside Afghanistan right now. But just like um, Ambassador Rahmani mentioned, please make sure you don't lose hope. And I promise you that we are all with you, and we'll try our best to, to do what we can to help the situation over there. Um, now, before moving on to the, to the third segment of the panel, which is possible solutions, I would like to draw your attention to the voices of women who are facing utmost challenges in Afghanistan. <laughs> دختر افغانی که امیدهایش را از دست داده است امیدی برای دوباره رفتن به مکتب دختری که برای آرزوهایش می جنگید برای تحصیلش برای حقش برای آزادیش متعلم سنفی یازده بودم که در مکتب برایم بسته شد گروه آمد و تمام آرزوهای هم را گرفت طالبان با آمدنشان مکاتب و دانشگاه ها را برای ما بستن به جرم این که زن هستیم ما سالها جنگیدیم، سالها تلاش کردیم تا آیندی وطن من را روشن بسازیم، اما حال برای حقوق انسانی خود می جنگیم. رنجها و مشکلاتی که ما زنان دختران در افغانستان تحت حاکمیت سالبان متعمل می شویم به شمارند. نمونه ایهان بستماندن دروازه های علم و دانش برای زنان دختران است و همچنان پرشوش اجباری و موانه های فراوان دیگر. در سال سیزه نوید و چار با پولیس پیوستم. در بخشای وزارت داخل ایفای وظیفه میکردم و از جان و مردم خود محافظت میکردم اما از زمانی که طالبا آمده متاسفانه هم بیکار شدیم و هم نامید حالا حتی نمیتوانم از جان خود محافظت کنم چی برسد به جان دیگران روزی که مکتب من خلاص کردم با هزار آرزو میخواستم پنتون شروع کنم اما با آمدن طالبا ای آرزوهایی که در دل داشتم مکمل ای آرزوهایی در دلم ماند 
په اتم ټولګي کې چې ښوونځی د انجونو پر مخ وترل شو او طالبان راغلل ما هیله درلوده چې ډاکتر شم او خپل وطن ته خدمت وکړم او خپلو هیلو ته ورسېږم ما وغوښتل چې خرج کې تحصیل وکړم چې دو کاله مخ کې د خاورو لاندې شو اوس چې ښوونځی زمونږ پر مخ ترل شوی نور نشم کولی خپلو خیالاتو او هیلو ته فکر وکړم It has been more than two years that girls have been banned from education. There are still women in Taliban prisons, and the number of female prisoners is increasing day by day. Violations of human rights, especially women's rights, are rampant and uncontrolled in Afghanistan. Has the world forgotten the women of Afghanistan, or will they find a serious solution for it? Ms. Clark, with over 20 years of experience in global development and human rights, in your opinion, what could be the solution to the problem? I really believe that you, Farhuna, are a part of the solution. I think this organization launching is a part of the solution. I think this collective power of women who are refusing to forget or to turn away um, are a part of our solution. I was on a call with um, country directors from all over the world uh, earlier this morning, and they talked about solidarity and how they're all working in contexts of war and crisis. Our Afghanistan country director, our country director calling us from the West Bank, uh, all of them in points of crisis. And each one of them talked about solidarity as a lifeline. Solidarity as a lifeline that was enabling them to, to reclaim visions and dreams and hopes and know that they are not being forgotten. And I think that is a part of what we need to build and generate. We need to not go quietly into this, not suffer this reality, but instead find ways to come together in small groups, in larger groups, until we have built the level of solidarity and demand that it does change the future of a country, a future of a region, and the future of our world. Because like you were saying earlier, if this can happen in Afghanistan, it can and is happening all over the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here, here with us. Um, Ambassador Rahmani, as a woman from Afghanistan and the first female ambassador to the United States with numerous achievements, you've opened a window of hope for Afghan women. But now, these dreams seem to have vanished. From your perspective, what do you envision as the solution to navigate through the current situation? If the Taliban do not change, what particular steps can the United States and the world take to improve the situation for women in Afghanistan? Thank you. Um, let me pick up part of the question first. If the Taliban doesn't change, I don't have much hope that the Taliban will change. They doesn't change because this is what, it's, it's their ideology. It is, it's, it's the ideology that brings them to power. They have not changed. They did not change from who they were before. They learned looking at the world way more than the world learned looking at them or overlooking at them, I should say. Uh, but they did not change, and they will not change. What changed was the international community lowering the bar. Now, the biggest request or ask of them is, Please allow girls to go to school beyond sixth grade. Is that really the world in this era that we are asking and wanting? That is, that is the core of the issue. And I do not think necessarily they will change because they see women empowerment as the biggest threat to their survival. Now, 
what can be done? What can the international community do? There is different menu sets for the, depending on the different cuts we could have. First of all, the international community has to do a will check. How much they would like to really contribute and in what ways. At this point, the biggest problem is the policy is not having a policy for Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. That should change. You need a policy for Afghanistan. Not having a policy is not, is not the right policy. Second, just thinking that, okay, this security situation being Afghanistan is now somewhat covered because we do it through the over the horizon security uh, possibilities that we have and through other means is not going to last very long because the embeddedness of the ideas of extremism and terrorism, the way it will grow and embed would be a threat for the world. So they need to consider that. And thirdly, when it comes to the women, situation of women in Afghanistan, as I have I said in uh, responding to the first question, it's not a box, it's not a nicety, it's not a, it is an ethical issue, it is a moral issue, but it's way more and beyond that. It is life, it is who we are, it is, it's the human kind. So, it has to be incorporated in the security policy, in the development policy, in the economic policy. What can you do practically in the absence of the bandwidth for Afghanistan? One of the things I have been advocating a lot with the international community has been that if now you don't have bandwidth to look at this more realistically and wholeheartedly, then at least support uh, empowerment of the people of Afghanistan, most importantly, economically. Support economic initiatives. Let people earn their livelihood with dignity. That is the most important thing, whether it's men or women, boys and girls, they need to be able to have access to economic opportunities. Thank you. Ms. Munsif, as a successful woman from Afghanistan, you have accomplished remarkable achievements. We believe that many women in Afghanistan currently facing restrictions simply need freedom and access to standard education to allow to follow a path similar to that of a successful and proud individual like yourself. How do you envision a solution to the current situation for women in Afghanistan? Additionally, do you think the international community, including countries like Canada, can employ various tools to bring about a positive change uh, in this situation? Ariana Jan, you're being very kind. Um, uh, and I have to say, um, Afghans all over the world have been so kind to me. Um, when I was elected, when I was appointed to cabinet, um, your your kindness, uh, your tashwiq uh, rashama, hiç vakt as you absolutely deserve it. I want you guys to give her a round of applause. Honestly, we're so proud of you. Buzurgi um, shamaya, but I want to say this: as me, خیلی هوشیار تر، خیلی لایق تر، پشت کار بیشتر، much smarter than me. More hardworking than me, more talented than me, are millions of girls in Afghanistan right now. And millions all over the world. The only difference is that, like you said, no one stood in my way. No one said, you have to get married right now. I was given choice. I was given a voice. I was given opportunities. And when I needed somebody to defend me, to stand up for me, women and men were beside me. That's the only difference. What can we do for those millions of girls, women, whose potential can make the world a better place for everyone? First of all, as we've said here tonight many times, create opportunities to hear their voices. Second, when the women of Afghanistan tell us what they think, what's happening, believe them. We didn't believe them when they said the new Taliban will be worse. We didn't believe them when they said 
a hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan will be catastrophic. We didn't believe them when they said, things are just gonna get worse for us. These guys say that things will be better, but they won't be. And now we barely hear them. So when we do, respect them enough to believe what they say. Those men in Afghanistan, you hold all the power right now. We beg you to speak up, to stand up for us, because you can make the difference. And while I agree that there will be some little boys who will grow up to be angry and hateful towards women because of the way they see their teachers, their mothers being treated right now, I look at the way that my son is with me. He's crying back there for me right now. Oh, such um, a cutie. <laughs> our sons, when they see their mothers doing well, they thrive. But when their mothers are being hurt, they break. They're depressed. They are less than. So for the sake of our sons, we have to stand up for the women. Women themselves know the solutions. When aid is being delivered to Afghanistan, women's organizations should be the first to decide how, where, and when those dollars get deployed. I also want to say something about diaspora, Ariana John, because your first question I didn't fully answer, mostly because I thought speaking to the status of women in Afghanistan deserved a bit more time. But the role of diaspora, first of all, if you live in a democratic country, know the name of your representatives. Ask for a meeting with them. You can go alone or you can go as part of a group but ask for a meeting. Prepare to speak for five minutes and listen for 20 minutes and ask questions about how you can raise the voice of Afghan women in your democratic institutions. When you have the opportunity to vote, please vote. When you find candidates that you believe in, candidates who promise that they will speak up and advocate for Afghans, whether it's in Australia or New Zealand or in Canada or US or anywhere in Europe or UK, support them, go knock on doors for them, raise money for them, and then hold them to account. Hold them to account. Don't just wait for a crisis to ask decision makers to stand up and speak up. Consistently show up to those halls of power and ask to be heard those journalists who write about Afghanistan, support them. Offer them your voice, offer them your expertise. Donate to organizations who raise money for Afghan women particularly. When there is a gathering for Afghans, show up to that gathering. Write opinion pieces on social media and in traditional media. And if you have the fortune to live in a country where you as a citizen can run for office, surround yourself with a great team of people and run because even the act of you running, whether you win or not, is an act of resistance and will elevate the status of Afghan women everywhere. And lastly, be kind, as Madam Ambassador said. Be kind to each other. There is no Afghan anywhere in the world who has not been affected by what happened in Afghanistan two years ago and what's happening today. All the more reason to be kind to one another. Thank you so much. I would like to now call you, Zarmina, my love, for the audience information. Zarmina was actually the lady, the woman who got shot in the head. Uh, by the Taliban in the middle of a football field. She didn't have a name then, but her name apparently was Zarmina. Now, the stage is yours to convey your message to the world out there. I just want, it's not my request, but on the behalf of all Afghan women who are currently living in Afghanistan in this situation, from all 
uh, organizations, institutions all around the world to stay with those who are supporting women and be the voice of Afghan women, raise the voice of Afghan women. As you all may know that who sold our country, but currently women are paying the price badly. So please stay with us and support us and be our voice. Thank you so much. Let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you so much, Irene. Um, your voice is important, and I'm glad you were there with us. And uh, we will try our best to spread this voice and make the world hear it. Uh, as we enter the final segment of uh, the panel, the question and answer session, I encourage our audience members to ask any questions they may have for our panelists, including Zermina John. دا اکثر پلتفرم ها دا اکثر جایا وقتی که از حقوق زن افغانستان گپ زده میشه و همیش سخن اول از محرومیتشان محرومیت درسشان می باشه یعنی هرچند که دیگه محرومیت های شما هم ذکر میکنن اما محرومیت اول که ذکر میشه محرومیت یا بسته بودن دروازه های دانشگاه و مکاتب است شما من حیث یک زن که در افغانستان زندگی فعلی را دارین تنها از دانشگاه و مکاتب محروم نیستین بسته از جامعه هست شدین اگر دوستایی که در مردمایی که دایاسپورا یا هر کسی که خارج از افغانستان حضور دارن و هم دوستای بین المللی ما اگر اینا با طالبان معامله بکنن و تنها درای مکاتب و دانشگاه را به شما باز کنن آیا شما آزر هستین که با این معامله راضی باشین نظر شما چیزی از شخصی که در افغانستان زندگی میکنین و زندگی تان کاملا قسمی خود تان گفتین در یک تنگنا قرار دارین و در تاریک ترین روزای زندگی تان سپری میکنین تشکر تشکر خواهر عزیز در رابطه به سوال تان به تو بگویم که اول خو امی درس و مکاتب و پهنتون که از قلب یک جامعه امی مکتب و پهنتون و دانشگاه است که باعث بشه مغز ها رشد بکنن، درک بکنن و بفهمند که چی واقع جریان داره. وقتی این درها به روی دخترها بسته شوه، اونا مثل سالهای گذشته دوره های قبل نه از حق و حقوق خود آگاه میشن، نه از جامعه، نه از جامعه بین الملل و نه از دیگر جهان آگاهی پیدا میکنن. پس اولین کار به خاطر بسته کردن ذهنیت خانم ها بسته کردن دوازه های تعلیم و تربیه بروشان است. وقتی که یک زن آگاهی نداشته باشه وقتی که زن نفهمه وقتی که یک زن در خانه بمانه و از همه جا غافل باشه پس چیگونه می که چی حق و حقوق داره که باید از او دفاع کنه وقتی من حق و حقوق میگم منظور ما از افغانستان تمام حقوق انسانی و اسلامی ما است که طالبا هر دو را از ما گرفتن. و اگر طالبا جوامع بین الملل بخواید با طالبا معامله کنه فقط به خاطر باز شدن در درهای مکاتب و دانشگاه ها برای دخترها این معمولا گفتم یک چیز قابل قبول نیست ما تنها نمیریم که مکتب بریم و دانشگاه بریم بعدا بریم به خانه بشینیم ما بسیار راه های دیگه داریم که باید به طرفش حرکت بکنیم ما بسیار چیزهای دیگه می خواهیم که باید به دست بیاریم تنها مکتب و دانشگاه کافی نیست و قبل انا ما در آخرین مسجد خود گفتم ما میفهمیم که ما را کی کشور ما را کی فرو ولی ما کسایی هستیم که قیمت شو بدترین شکل ممکن پیلا میپردازیم و از امی خاطر توقع ما به هنه حیث یک زن افغان و به عنوان نماینده از تمام زنهای افغان از تمام جوامی بین ملال و کسانی که از حقوق زن دفاع میکنن همی است که در هر حالت صدای واقعی زنهای افغان بشنوند و یک کس باشن که واقعا بفهمند در جامعه افغانی چی جریان داره و از حق و قوق زنان چه بوده باید دفاع کنند. ما می خواهیم که بفتخار فرخنده جان عزیز ما و تمام زنای دیگه افغانستان یک دفعه به پا استاده شویم و یک کف محکم برشان بزنیم. We salute you for your courage. Thank you for being with us tonight. And we will not forget you, that's for sure.
and we will continue fighting for you. Uh, before I make my final uh, remarks, I would like to express my utmost gratitude to TriVision Studios, TriVision team, for always being amazing partners to us and for helping and supporting us tonight with uh, this DEFA initiative. Thank you so much, everybody. I thank everyone for their questions, uh, and I'm very grateful for the presence of our esteemed uh, panelists and guests for their uh, comprehensive and useful uh, discussion. We will take these discussions to other relevant institutions and organizations and ask them to consider the women's voices in Afghanistan and react to the tragedies they are facing on a daily basis. We ask the international community and organizations involved in the subject matter not to leave Afghan women alone. Today, women of Afghanistan need you more than ever. DEFA as a specific and committed address for Afghan women is ready for any kind of cooperation, planning and implementation of various programs and is committed to bring an effective movement like tonight so that we can make changes in the situation of women in Afghanistan. Thank you.